working through, this is John Batista's College Physics 5th edition. Chapter summaries, not the chapter, just the summary. So read the book. Uh, so do you remember in the last semester when you did this? Here is the ground. And then here is an, a ball of mass M, and it's going to fall. And one of the things that we did, you said, okay, we could calculate the, the gravitation, the force. We could calculate the change in velocity, all that stuff. But we could also use the work energy principle. So if this moves down a displacement delta y, then we could say work done by gravity is mg delta y. Gravity does, um, it's actually be net cosine theta. No, wait. So gravity, um, which should be positive, mg delta, but it's moving down. So it actually technically be negative because the gravitational force is down, right? <clears throat> and then we can use that to say that's a change in energy. Or you could use the system of the ball plus the earth. And you could take that work done by gravity and move to the other side, and you could say zero, no work done, it's a change in gravitational potential energy plus the change in kinetic energy, whatever, and gravitational potential was mgy. Do you remember that? It's the negative of the work done. That was important. And g is the gravitational field, y is the, the position, but we really care about the change in potential over here in the work energy principle. Work is a change in energy. That's where that comes from. Do you remember that? And then wait, it's even better. If I had something like a planet and I had an object over here moving around, we could, we could define gravitational potential energy for a planet of U equals negative G M1 M2 over R. Do you remember that? You probably didn't derive this one because uh, it requires calculus, and this is an algebra-based course. But you've surely used that. Super useful. Okay, now let's jump ahead. I'm getting some more paper. I should always have more paper, but I never have more paper. It turns out that we can do the same thing with electric fields and electric forces. If I have... Uh, a charge Q1 and a charge Q2, let's say it's plus, it doesn't really matter, Q2 separated by a distance R, then I can define this as a potential U as K Q1 Q2 over R. Notice the big difference here. The minus sign. The minus sign. There's no minus sign here because, remember, gravitational force, gravitational fields look like electric force, electric fields. But there's a very big difference other than the constant K. K equals 9 times 10 to the ninth newtons meter squared per coulomb squared. Other than that, Q can be positive or negative. So if these are both positive, this is a repulsive force, and so the potential is actually positive. If I have this, one of them's negative, then I would get uh, U as also negative, because one of these would be negative, and it'd be a retractive force, just like the gravitational potential. And so this is our electric potential energy, technically with respect to infinity. Just like before, we did the same thing with gravity. Now, what if you have a constant electric field, which you can have if you have this, some constant electric field, and I move from here to there, you could do the work done by the electric field. It would be work done by the field would be uh, the charge, Q, the value of the charge, times the electric field, times the distance it moved. It should be a positive amount. But and I'm going from here to there. But if I want to change that into potential energy, the change in potential energy would be negative QED. Because remember, what we're doing is moving that work to the other side of the, of the equation to make it a potential energy. 
And that is important. If I'm going with the electric field, I'm decreasing an electric potential energy with a positive charge. But again, we have positive charges, we have negative charges. It's actually easier for both of these things. This is for constant field. And that's really important. And this is moving in the direction of the field. If I actually move perpendicular to the field, the change of the potential is zero. It's complicated. But we like to look at the potential energy per charge. Potential, and this is really, hold on, hold on, this is going to get crazy. Potential energy per charge, we call this, what do you think we should call that? The potential energy per charge, we're going to call the potential. <laughs> Isn't that a bad choice of words? So if I take this and divide by that charge, delta U over Q is the change in potential, and we use the symbol V. Again, bad choice here. The units for V are joules per coulomb, which is equal to one volt. So the, it'd be like having uh, measuring meters, distance in meters, and using M for distance, right? Because they both have M. But that's what we do here. So the change in potential is the potential energy per charge. And so over here, we get the, the, chain, the potential with respect to infinity, V is equal to KQ over R. That's with respect to infinity. But both of those are in units of volts. Let me show you something really, uh, just take a little a side step here, because maybe you've seen something like this. Put it right here so you can see it. Why is it 10? Oh, that's just, this is a, a voltmeter. Well, it's actually a multimeter. And it tells the potential difference between these two ends. If I touch these together, it goes to zero. Because the distance between these two is zero, so there should be no change in potential. If I look at a battery and I put these on the ends, it measures the potential difference from one side to the other. In this case, it's 1.5. If I switch these, it gets positive 1.5. 1.5 volts. Normal uh, alkaline battery, a D, C, double A, that says it right there. 1.5 volts. That is the change in electric potential from one side to the other. So you could actually use that and say, well, if I have a charge going from this side to that side, I could get the change in, in the potential energy by multiplying by the value of the charge. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that we're going to do with that uh, later. But I wanted to show you a, a multimeter. This is voltage. We talk about it. And the most important thing, it does need two wires. We are talking about a change in potential. Even when I write this, it's a change, right? Because the other end is V equals zero at infinity. Remember when we were talking about superposition for electric fields? Well, superposition works for electric potential also. So if this is Q1 and Q2, I can find the potential right here as the sum of the potentials, V equals V1 plus V2. Now, it's actually a lot easier because since electric potential is a scalar, We don't have to worry about direction. So all I need to know is that distance and that distance and find the potential due to each one and add it together. And that's the total potential with respect to infinity. Okay, what else do we have? There's a bunch of small stuff in here. Um, equal potential lines. Uh, equal potential lines, if I have a positive charge and I draw, I could, an equal potential line is a line where the electric feet potential is the same throughout that whole thing, equal potential. And the, the cool thing about this is that uh, if you've played with, uh, so maybe this is, let's say, 1 volt, 2 volts, 3 volts, actually be the other way around, 3, 2, 1. This looks like a contour map, right? Because by looking at how the potential changes, we can tell how the electric field is. Now, this one's kind of hard, um, but the electric field, let's see, do they even talk about that in here? It, the electric field points in the direction of decreasing potential. So the potential is that way, 
decreasing that way, that's the direction of the electric field. And it's perpendicular to the equipotential lines. But we already knew that. I don't think this is, there's some complicated stuff there. I don't really want to worry about it too much. Um, one thing, though, is that I can say the change in potential for a constant electric field is negative ed. We already said that, if you're moving in the direction. And if electric field is in newtons per coulomb, but this is in volts, and we divide by meters, a newton per coulomb is a volt per meter. They are the same thing. That's kind of important. We talked about these parallel plate capac uh, capacitors, right? And the electric field inside of them is constant. E equals uh, A over Q, no, no, Q over epsilon naught A. But what about the potential difference from one side to the other? That does depend on the distance D. Right, because the electric field, if the electric field is, you have to move over a larger distance, it's going to be a larger change in potential going from one side to the other. So we, we actually can define uh, a property of this, both the size, and if I increase the amount of charge, I increase the field. If I increase the size, I increase the, if I increase A, no, this is, is that right? Is it Q? Wait, epsilon naught. That's right, Q over A. So you want that to be bigger. No, wait. Okay, well, we define capacity. That's right, though, right? Or is it QA? No, that's right. It just doesn't, I'm just, it doesn't seem right. It seems like the bigger the area. Oh, because it's the charge per. Okay, you have less charge. That's fine. That's right. So we define uh, this property of capacitance as delta V as, no, no, I'm getting it all backwards, Q over delta V. And that's capacitance measured in farads. It's important because we're going to use capacitors later, okay, uh, for circuits and stuff like that. Um, one of the important things is that we can actually consider the energy stored in a capacitor, U, as one half Q delta V. But Q is C times delta V. So we can write this as one half C delta V squared. But still, it tells us something about the energy in that field. And then if I divide by the volume of that, I get something that actually is kind of cool. It's the energy density, which is one half epsilon naught E squared. That's the uh, energy density of the electric field. So you, there's actually energy stored in the electric field. That's kind of important. Um, there's a thing about the dielectric constant uh, kappa as E0 over E. I don't really want to talk about that too much. It's just, it's, it's kind of important, but you know, I'm trying to get to the basics, the very basics here. I think that's good enough for chapter 17. Um, there's a lot of great applications, and we'll talk about those at some other time.